think you're supposed to start with the word of the day, are you? Yeah. Right. Bypass introductions, Dr. Bernstein. How do I get to Natty? Is here. All right, I'm sorry. I had on my calendar 8 o'clock in the morning. I apologize. Um, but we made a record. These are my conflict of interest. This is the talk today, which is treatment of chronic urticaria and angioedema unresponsive to H1 antagonists. These are my conflict of interest. These are the objectives to look at uh, treatment options pre biologics, uh, discuss current day treatment of chronic uh, spontaneous urticaria, and define future therapies. Uh, I start off with this. Uh, 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 comment, this, uh, which was uh, written in 1954, John Sheldon's group, uh, although urticaria often is rather transient and trivial illness, which scarcely merits very serious medical attention, some patients with severe chronic or recurrent hives are indeed most uncomfortable and appreciative for whatever help one can give them. So I don't think that statement is um, completely accurate. However, uh, it is true in the respect that we, uh, uh, if we can manage these patients properly, uh, we can uh, have a significant impact on their uh, clinical well-being. These are the treatments that were available in 1954. Uh, avoidance, which we do recommend for acute when there is an obvious uh, trigger. Uh, rotating diets, which certainly have met with a lot of controversy uh, over the years and currently. Uh, there are some groups, especially in Germany, that are advocating certain elimination diets. Des uh, desensitization to inducible factors. Uh, again, uh, uh, we don't advocate this for chronic spontaneous urticaria. Antihistamines, which we certainly have in common, epinephrine, uh, cortisone, and then because all the other uh, 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 types of treatments that were recommended. The novel therapies at that time was insulin, IV colchicine, and one of the uh, probably reasons why colchicine might work in some situations, especially neutrophilic urticaria, might be because it does disrupt inflammasomes in uh, uh, mast cells, uh, I mean, in, um, in neutrophils and in uh, uh, monocytes. Snake venom, histidine decarboxylase. I don't know if you guys have uh, patients with mast cell activation coming in on supplements and so forth where they can break down histamine or prevent the formation of histamine from histidine. Um, Heparin, which actually was studied, uh, and, and now there are certain people advocating anticoagulants for uh, treatments of urticaria and so forth. But there really wasn't a much, there really wasn't much available. Uh, and this is just, you know, a little a cartoon, and whoops, yeah. Uh, impact on quality of life and healthcare cost is significant. It says, I must say, Mr. James, you have the worst case of highs I've ever seen. So um, the, uh, page down. Here we are. So this is the treatment comparison between uh, uh, the international guidelines, uh, which were uh, disseminated last year, uh, and the U.S. guidelines, which were disseminated in 2014. And you can see that they have some things in common. They both recommend monotherapy uh, with uh, an anti second generation antihistamine. They, uh, and the step up for the uh, international is to increase the dose up to two to four times the dose, which has been shown in studies to be very safe. But in contrast, the U.S. guidelines recommended also adding other therapies, such as H2 antagonists, leukotriene modifying agents. They even recommended possibly first generation antihistamine at bedtime in subsets, subsets of patients. Uh, whereas step three for the international guidelines add Omalizumab, going right from high dose antihistamines to omalizumab, uh, the U.S. guidelines recommended uh, dose advancement to possibly more potent antihistamines, such as doxepin, for instance, at bedtime. And then finally, step four is uh, adding for the for the international guidelines is the cyclosporin add-on versus uh, at the time of this guideline, 2014, omalizumab had yet had just been. Uh, disseminated, had just been released and approved, and uh, it really wasn't as much information as we have today, but it was a, 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 dis a discussion as to whether one should select omalizumab biologic versus immunosuppressant versus an anti-inflammatory. The, the international guidelines have chosen to take all of these 
other uh, therapies and put them into what they call the Pandora's box, the alternative treatments. Uh, and the reason why you're seeing difference is because these guidelines are much different. Whereas the U.S. guidelines is more of a traditional evidence, uh, medical evidence-based guidelines, but it's relying a lot on expert opinion. The uh, international guidelines was a grade methodology. So it was a very rigorous analysis of the medical literature and only articles that or only studies that could really withstand the, the rigor of grade methodology could be, uh, uh, where it could be used to make strong recommendations. Uh, so you can see in, immediately as we develop guidelines, there's a certain bias towards, uh, you know, institutions or uh, organizations that can afford to develop these types of high-powered uh, studies. Now, this is a um, study that we did. Uh, this was uh, looking at what, what is the need for alternative novel therapies and trying to see how well did patients perform uh, in the uh, uh, you know, pre-omalizumab uh, pre era. And this is looking at our population and looking at different combinations of first and second generation antihistamines, uh, leukotriene modifying agents and such. And what we found essentially in this study is that 38% of patients were completely controlled on this regimen. And this reflects what others have reported in the literature. Um, when you look at um, other uh, therapies, uh, um, such as uh, these immunosuppressants, anti-inflammatories, and even omalizumab, we had three patients at the time, so, which we saw a third responded. And that's what they reported in the Astoria uh, trial, about 39% complete responders. Um, we found, uh, basically, that 33% were controlled with cyclosporine and about 18.5% required ongoing prednisone despite these other therapies to control their severe hives. So there was definitely a need for newer therapies to help improve management. So the question then asks is, what, are there specific patient characteristics associated with treatment outcomes for chronic urticaria? And this is, we, we, we also looked at this. We looked at the uh, therapies that were used. We looked at different uh, covariates. And uh, basically, um, what we found, uh, you know, we found some interesting associations. Uh, but uh, for instance, uh, it's not surprising that we saw for Dapsone that there was a 5.4, uh, you know, uh, odds ratio of improvement with uh, dapsone in patients who had a predominance of neutrophils on histology. Uh, we found some other interesting uh, uh, associations. Uh, uh, but again, uh, this illustrates the difficulty. In, uh, and then for cocosine, actually, we found an interesting one associated with physical therapies as well as uh, uh, prede predilection to uh, race. But you can see that in most of these studies, it's very difficult to take large clinical sets and then try to associate clinical characteristics. And this is really why we've had difficulty in trying to understand phenotypes of urticaria, because it's not as simple as that, as just putting your population. First of all, this is one center. It's a skewed population. But even when you do multi-center uh, studies to try to understand clinical characteristics, it becomes very difficult. So under, understanding phenotypes for urticaria is extremely important to be able to select proper treatments. These are just looking at the alternative treatments, such as we, that we talked about, uh, 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 and what the pros and cons are. Certainly, uh, these are therapies that may be necessary even in today's time when people don't respond to uh, um, uh, amalizumab. Uh, uh, Dapstone, sulfasalazine, colpacine, uh, uh, hydroxychloroquine, the data is limited, uh, and there's certainly some require some of these drugs require laboratory monitoring for adverse events. They are generally well tolerated, might be efficacious in properly selected patients uh, who are uh, uh, who are not responsive to antihistamines. But these are uh, the, the because of the great evidence methodology that was used, they were not included in the international guidelines, as I've mentioned. So, this is the uh, in the U.S. They were included because of the expert opinion and because of the lack of other therapies and going based on the literature, but, but in the European and the international guidelines, they were removed. In terms of cyclosporine, we know that it has a broad effect on uh, 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 cytokines uh, and, uh, and uh, a nuclear uh, factor kappa beta in terms of their production. Uh, it does require a lot of monitoring. There have been some double-blind placebo-controlled trials looking at effect. Um, and it, there is some effect on, re, on histamine release. Uh, and also, uh, uh, there was some study showing that autologous skin test also re, uh, 
uh, was reduced in patients who uh, responded, indicating that it might have had an effect on uh, antibody responses. But it, and therefore, it was recommended by both uh, uh, groups as a step four therapy based on this evidence. It wasn't strong, but and there's flaws, and there's a large section in the U.S. guidelines written by David Lang on the uh, analysis of cyclosporin and its limitations. But for that, for the most part, uh, it does have some benefit. And in fact, some patients who are treated with this therapy, if you select them properly, have very good response and can go into remission within less than six months. So they do respond. If they're going to respond, they're going to respond within that first three to six months. This is looking at the evidence of therapies for chronic uh, spontaneous urticaria. care. You can see I'm not going to belabor this, but you can look at the, uh, there's, you know, some of these have very low adverse events. Some of them have more moderate effects uh, or high side effects. Um, the amount of evidence is, uh, is generally low, although some have better effect. Uh, uh, certainly, there's a lot of evidence for H1 antihistamines. Um, and, uh, uh, and the cost, again, some of these drugs are, you know, when you look at their costs, except for maybe things like uh, uh, cyclosporin, uh, you know, their cost is relatively uh, low compared to what we are using today as our third line uh, treatments in many situations. So these are the alternative therapies that are in the uh, international guidelines. They just put them all together. They didn't differentiate between them. So they just kind of select them. I want to emphasize that uh, I was not entirely in favor of, of this when we, because I was on, on both guidelines. Uh, and the reason, because I was concerned that when patients don't respond to uh, amalizumab, and when they don't respond to cyclosporin, then what? The clinician is going to have no experience, no knowledge of these agents, what they do, how they work. So I really do feel that it's important, and, and we wrote this as a uh, review and an editorial, that the U.S. guidelines is still very germane because it's a compilation of a lot of information and, uh, about these therapies that you should be familiar with in the situation when you get that refractory patient, which I am starting to see in my clinical practice. I have these patients who don't respond to these biologics. They're miserable, uh, and they're not responding to some of these alternative therapies, too. So, uh, and this is becoming uh, uh, a, a, a somewhat of an issue. So the era of biologics began with uh, malizumab, again, in contrast, uh, uh, as I mentioned, with alternative agents for refractory urticaria. Efficacy was supported by well-designed, large double-blind randomized studies, relatively low rate of clinical adverse events. Did, uh, it still inherited the boxed warning uh, that the asthma indication in, uh, 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 inherited, although we are not seeing this issue in terms of uh, allergic reactions in this population. Uh, and, uh, but again, because of these criteria and this, uh, the grade methodology, it really was moved up from step four to step three in the international guidelines. And, you know, I think that we've adapted this uh, uh, sense, given the uh, significant amount of literature out there now with looking at amalizumab. This is just showing the original uh, studies, looking at uh, amalizumab uh, and showing that, it, uh, again, it was uh, a very effective and uh, the 300 milligram dose being more effective than the 150, but both were approved. Uh, again, the, the big issues with omalizumab is number one, uh, it is, uh, uh, it still has to be administered in the office, so patients have to come in and get their shots. Uh, the optimal dose, frequency administration, treatment duration, how to step down over time is still unclear. Uh, there's still a lot of uh, clinical decision making. It's not, uh, it's, uh, and then there's no v really validated clinical or biochemical markers that predict response, except that there is some data now showing that in patients who do have autologous antibodies, or who make IgG antibodies against FC epsilon receptor 1 alpha subunit or the IgG antibody on the uh, receptors, that they tend to have either a, a slower response or no response. So this is a predictor. So all of a sudden now, these autoantibodies might have some clinical relevance in how we select patients. And this is in contrast, which I'll show you in a moment, to the early pilot studies, which didn't seem to see a difference in response in patients who had these autoantibodies or not. Um, so uh, we, and then the cost is another issue. You know, we used to think that, uh, you know, second generation antihistamines were expensive before they became generic and leukotriene modifying agents were expensive. This is nothing. They're, they're, this, we're talking a whole different scale of, of economy. Um, so, uh, so here we have this uh, chronic spontaneous urticaria syndrome 
uh, it's a heterogeneous clinical symptoms and presentations. Uh, again, uh, we need to start thinking this. This is really an adapted uh, uh, illustration from, uh, from uh, Latval when he, he actually published on the asthma phenotype. And, that, and so it's the same concept that we should be looking at chronic spontaneous urticaria phenotype characteristics, which I've already alluded is not easy. It's difficult to do when you look at large population studies to really try to find relative relevant characteristics that would cluster one group here and another group here and another group here. But in order to do that, though, we really do have to develop better biomarkers, better uh, ways of characterizing these patients so we can develop better endotypes. And it's when we have these endotypes that will allow us to determine what is the best treatment for each individual. And I think we had a discussion last night about asthma and type 2 inflammation and the best biologic to treat, and we still don't really have a great direction, okay? We, you know, we know we have type 2 inflammation, we have eosinophils, uh, but, uh, it, you know, when do we use one versus another? It's not crystal clear uh, uh, completely. So these are just some examples of urticaria phenotypes, which have endotypes. The cryopyranopathies uh, 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 have, uh, you know, certainly uh, they've got a gene chromosome. They've got identified protein. We know the transmission. They've got clinical features, and we have a design treatment that can actually uh, control this condition. So this is an example uh, where. Uh, one, uh, this is where we need to go to some extent when we start looking at other forms of uh, chronic spontaneous urticaria. For now, we have, we're stuck with algorithms, and this is a good algorithm. This is in the international guideline. I think it actually starts off with wheels and angioedema and addresses both of these manifestations of urticaria uh, as urticaria, as well as just as angioedema. And I recommend that one looks at this because it does help, you know, at least sort, is this patient presenting with more of a bradykinin mediated angioedema? Does this patient have more of a histaminergic uh, urticaria? As we know that patients present with urticaria and angioedema about 40% of the time, but they have, may have isolated angioedema about 20% of the time and the urticaria by themselves about 40% of the time. So, so this allows us to at least go through this process and predict is someone going to actually be more responsive to antihistamines or are they gonna require alternative therapy? So there's big gaps here because we, there is a, um, uh, a, a good bit of, um, this is where the critical issue is, is right here in the middle is looking at the, uh, uh, you know, uh, which direction uh, to go, uh, uh, but also when you think about the wheels, you know, at the very end, is this chron chronic spontaneous? Is it chronic inducible? Now we replace the term inducible, uh, 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 we, we replace the term physical with inducible. Uh, and that was also, a, the terminology was another bone of contention, but the reason we did that is because not all the physical triggers are necessarily uh, physical triggers like cholinergic or adrenergic urticaria, these are more inducible triggers through uh, heat, anxiety, and so forth. So, um, uh, you know, body temperature changing and so forth. So that was something that was conceded as well. Uh, but we have this new terminology. For the fellow's sake, the old terminology will apply to the boards to disregard this. This is not going to be on your boards. Okay. The, um, uh, but that being said, uh, there's overlap with the chronic spontaneous because many patients have chronic inducible components such as heat, cold, exercise, pressure, sunlight, dermographism, and so forth. So this kind of puts it all together, tries to summarize it. It's a good guideline to look at and algorithmic approach. So when we look at approaches for phenotypic characterization, we always start with um, uh, characteristics, comorbidities, histology, biomarkers, and then, of course, treatment response, pre-post changes in proteins or transcriptomes, biological pathways. Um, so this is, uh, you know, again, a, a, a cumbersome approach, but it's something that one needs to do to really understand uh, the, uh, the, the phenotype that we're addressing for chronic urticaria. Biomarkers really are critical here, and this is really where we've, uh, we've made some progress, but not a lot. This is just looking at a study by Eli Megan, uh, uh, looking at clinical and laboratory biomarkers and antihistamines responsive and non-responsive patients. And you can see that, uh, that in patients uh, 
who um, are non-responsive, they tend to have more physical urticaria or inducible urticaria. Uh, they tend to have a higher uh, prevalence of autoantibodies, autologous serum skin tests, uh, maybe higher baseline urticaria activity scores, and, and they tend to be more basopenic, okay? And uh, uh, this is uh, something that's been looked at and it's being studied as well. Uh, Roni Sammy's doing a lot of work on bas basophils and urticaria. Uh, they've looked at indices, uh, mean platelet volume, C-reactive protein, C3s. So these are some things that have kind of permeated the literature, whether they're relevant or good broad biomarkers or not, is still unclear. Uh, but again, um, it is, they concluded from this study that antihistamine non-responsive patients were more clinically severe with labs consistent with low-grade inflammation and platelet activation. This is a study uh, that was um, done uh, several years ago looking at autoimmune characteristics in chronic urticaria patients and trying to see if there were uh, some relevance of these other autoantibodies, because not only do these patients with chronic urticaria uh, produce these IgG antibodies, FFC epsilon receptors, uh, high affinity IG re receptors, but they also have a preponderance of autoantibodies that are, are uh, present, thyroid autoantibodies, uh, uh, you know, ANAs and so forth. Uh, so they looked at this in the context of the uh, 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 patients, these, these different markers, whether they had a basal activation test or not, whether they had thyroid autoantibodies or not, and they looked at the pattern of medication use. And, you know, this is a good article to look at. This is a Javed Sheikh is the primary, is the senior author on this. There was no correlation between these uh, markers and no difference in the maximum number of vacations used in subgroups based on the presence or absence of these markers. Now, this is a relatively small study. Uh, so again, these are conclusions drawn from single sites and small, uh, 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 small centers, but it's, at least it's, nothing is just jumping out at us as biomarkers. How and this often, is, yes. Excuse me, how often would you do a skin biopsy in the workup? When would you do that? Well, I, I think, well, I think I have a slide on that, but right. uh, the, uh, I would do a, a, a biopsy in patients who are refractory to uh, step two therapy uh, because you really want to know do they have neutrophilic infiltrates, do they have, you know, you know lymphocytes, lymphocytes with, you know, perivascular eosinophils or, mm -hmm. you know, or, uh, or a mixture and so forth. If it's neutral, or of course, you're going to roll out vasculitis. You know, everybody says that, oh, you know, well, if you know urticaria vasculitis, when it's persistent and so forth. And actually, that's incorrect. There's been a study showing that uh, you can actually have evidence of urticaria vasculitis even when patients have evanescent hives that come and go within 24, 48 hours. So it's the whole adage that this is persistent is, is, is sine qua known for urticaria vasculitis is incorrect. Okay, so uh, it's a nice pathology biopsy study that uh, is cited in our guidelines and, and that is a nice uh, 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 caveat to this. So here's P Kaplan's study, which looked at the <coughs> preliminary study looking at amalizumab. This was an investigator-initiated study, and he, this is the demographic patient characteristics. And you can see several of these patients do have thyroid antibodies, and some of these patients also have uh, a... Um, uh, they also have um, a, a, a autologous uh, serum skin test, although I don't think I'm showing it in this, in this uh, uh, slide, but they, many of these patients did have an autoantibody. And what they, they showed here, uh, obviously, is that a significant number of these patients had good response uh, to uh, uh, amalizumab, as indicated by a reduction in their urticaria activity score over the course of the study. And many of these patients were complete responders. Uh, but they weren't able to show a correlation with the presence of these antibodies and, and respond or non-responders. And again, a small study, short study, so you have to, it's not really going to be uh, powered well enough to really make this determination. Um, and I was just il illustrating here that several patients who had uh, antibodies uh, still responded despite uh, this, um, uh, uh, having these autoantibodies. Um, now, these are, interestingly, they did some transcriptome studies uh, in, this was a study that was subsequently, uh, a different study that was done by Marcus Maurer's group, or it was a multi-center study in Europe, and they found, uh, these were proteins that were found in basophils of chronic spontaneous urticaria care patients treated with amalizumab. So they did use peripheral blood to look at transcriptomes and responders versus non-responders, and here you can see that uh, there's a number of different um, 
biological pathways that were identified. Now, this was a microarray analysis, an RNA microarray analysis, which is not the optimal way of looking at biological pathways. But they did find uh, a number of different, uh, 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 this is looking at there, this is looking at the uh, transcriptomes uh, before and after amalizumab. And the bottom line was they found that the transcripts related to mast cells, leukocytes, vascular, uh, vascularization, oxidative stress, and skin repair were upregulated in lesional uh, versus non-lesional skin in healthy uh, uh, volunteers. So, uh, and this is an interesting thing because uh, the skin repair uh, uh, pathways, I think, is very interesting because we think about defects in the epithelium in atopic dermatitis and maybe other eczematous disorders, but probably it's, it plays a role in urticaria as well. And we should be talking about good skin care with our patients who have chronic hives as well. You know, you start getting into the microbiome of the skin and uh, it, it, it probably applies to urticaria as well. Um, so that being said, this is where we are in the present day with uh, amalizumab and with the, the current treatments we have available. Now, uh, what does the future hold for us? Well, there are many potential novel targets for chronic spontaneous urticaria, and this is just a nice uh, illustration of the in, uh, inflammatory cells predominantly involved with highs, not completely. There's other cells that are likely involved, which I don't have here, but and the receptors that have been looked at and targeted for different disease entities. And some of the things that have been obviously being looked at, um, the, uh, uh, that have been, you see, certainly you look at the, uh, uh, the effects of amalizumab, but the uh, IL-4, IL-13, uh, the, um, there's uh, the histamine-4 receptors, these prostaglandin D2 receptors, uh, the, um, uh, there's uh, some other Siglic 8 receptors, which are an interesting set of molecules that are, are being investigated. We see that TSLP is, is floating in here as well. There's an aflatoxin receptors. So there's a number of neurokinin receptors, number of potential targets. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, what goes on in the test tube that, and what goes on in the animal model doesn't always translate what goes on in humans. And so going from a, from a conceptual point to a, uh, to a uh, you know, a, a drug development and a, dr a point where you actually have a, a drug to treat is a, a, a big process and a very costly uh, process. So many of the drugs that are currently being looked at some of them are novel and new compounds that we haven't seen yet, but they have life cycles and they're being looked at for many different indications, but they have to pick the indication they feel they're gonna get the biggest bang for the buck. Um, so these are some of the drugs currently under investigated. You can see that probably the one that's furthest along is uh, ligalizumab, which has completed phase two, is getting well into phase three studies. And, uh, and uh, there's also the uh, PGD2 receptors, which I mentioned. Um, which is being processed, some of the data processed are sick inhibitors. Uh, and of course, the, uh, the anti-IL-1 uh, compounds are also being currently looked at. Uh, there's uh, more, re just recently, the, uh, the Siglic-8 uh, 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 antagonist, uh, which is expressed on mast cells and eosinophils, this molecule, um, it uh, was complete, completed phase two A, A open label uh, trials in urticaria. So this is some of the this, this is some of the early data with legalizumab. The objective here was to establish efficacy and safety of legalizumab in adolescent and adult subjects with CSU who remain uh, symptomatic despite standard of care treatment by demonstrating better efficacy over malzumab. This is the first head-on-head -head study. Why would they do this? Why would Novartis cannibalize their own drug? Well, the patent's wearing off, right? <laughs> they need something to replace it, okay? So, uh, so it was a multi-center, randomized, double-blind, active placebo-controlled parallel group, screening period of 28 days, 52-week double-blind treatment period, and a 12-week post-treatment follow-up period. This is the uh, study uh, design. You can see that patients were randomized to receive either 72 milligrams every four weeks or 120 milligrams every four weeks of legalizumab. There was a uh, screening period, there was a randomization, and then um, they were, uh, the primary endpoint was at 12 weeks, but there was an extended 48 week uh, period uh, at, you know, uh, at uh, 24 weeks, uh, 
uh, patients who were receiving a placebo were actually uh, rolled over into legalism at 120 milligrams every four weeks. And then there was an observation period at the end. At the end. And you can see that there was, uh, compared to amalzumab, I'm not sure that this shows it greatly, but there, it, oligalizumab uh, performed better than amalzumab in this study. There was a high, complete, and well controlled response to oligalizumab at week 12 during the phase 2b core study. So there was good signals that this therapy, which is more of a son of, uh, uh, of, of uh, amalzumab, the more high affinity uh, formulation, seems to have. Uh, uh, even better effect than amalizumab in uh, controlling uh, uh, hives. And these are patients who achieved a UAS-7, an urticary activity score of zero at week 12. So they had no hives at week 12. Do you, do you agree with that number back slide, the success rate of omalizumab? Well, this is an interesting thing because, you know, the, depending on the study and how it's applied, you're going to see different results. And the fact that you... Um, See, um, uh, because if you look at the uh, amalizumab, uh, you talk about the amalizumab. Yeah, it's the, lower know, than I think you yeah, see in the real world. It, it is yeah. in the real world. It's about forty percent, about thirty. In the real world, I, okay, in the clinical studies, the story study, it was for, about thirty-nine, thirty-eight percent, close to forty percent. I think that that reflects real world. I think these studies do reflect what we see in the real world uh, very well, uh, in my experience. I think what we found in the amalzumab studies for, for urticaria is what I'm seeing in my population. Um, now, um, because we're seeing a lot of non-responders. And recognize, you know, looking at a clinical trial where you're taking all comers versus how we use this drug in our practice where we're selectively choosing patients is going to be a lot different in terms of the outcome. So a real-world study is not going to reflect uh, a double-blind placebo-controlled trial uh, in many situations. It's usually going to be higher, the data. The data is going to be better. Um, uh, but, no, I think that's, this is something, this, this, this may embolden other companies to use head-on-head -head comparisons when they do their analyses. And people are looking at this saying, wow, you know, why don't we use this to, as a comparator? Because, you know, from, from an economic perspective, when you come out with a drug that's expensive and you have to have evidence to tell uh, managed care companies why should this drug be used on the formulary and where should it be used and when should it be used, that could perform better than omalizumab, which you have already. Uh, that's going to be powerful for them to get this into uh, uh, into onto formularies. So again, there was a high rate of complete uh, and sustained symptom control, and it was achieved up to one year. So it was a sustained effect uh, over time. And there were a significant number of patients who also achieved the UAS score, uh, UAS seven score of less than or equal to six up to one year. So there was a number of partial responders as well. So. Uh, uh, so I think that uh, uh, that's very encouraging, and that's and and this program is moving forward, obviously, and hopefully next year, a couple years, we'll have this available. I think uh, uh, to play with. Um, but that's really the the closest new drug. Uh, there are a couple other things that are uh, being looked at, uh, and I'll mention those. The Siglics are an interesting group of compounds. For those who aren't familiar with Siglics, uh, they are members of the immunoglobin G superfamily that contain a sialicide binding and terminal domain. Uh, most Siglics have immunoreceptor tyrosine-based motifs, these items located on the in their intracellular domain. They suggest they're involved in negative cell signaling. Uh, and so these cell surface proteins are found predominantly on cells of the immune system. This is looking at the nomenclature and structural characteristics of human siglics. Um, and you can see the cells that are uh, involved. But basically, these, uh, uh, the, uh, depending on the different siglics, but what you can see is that, base, that, uh, that um, eosinophils and mast cells uh, contain siglic 8. Okay, so that's what uh, on the... Uh, uh, that one column where it says cyclic eight. So those are cells that express this fairly selectively. And so this has been a target. And this is a study, this is work that's been done with Bruce, by Bruce Bachner, and subsequently a, uh, this, this drug has been developed by a company called Alicor. Um The phase 2A open label, three groups were enrolled. We were one of the sites. There was not that many sites. Uh, Malazumab failure patients, Malazumab naive patients, and inducible hives. Uh, which were predominantly cholinergic and derm uh, dermatographic. And these were patients giving IV infusions. This is not a sub-Q therapy. It dosed up to three milligrams per kilogram. These were six monthly infusions uh, with another eight-week follow-up period. 
And basically what you see here is that for the refractory patients, six out of 11 had a good response by urticaria control. There was a 40, 49% showed a reduction in UAS-7. Uh, in the naive CSU uh, patients, 77% completed, uh, had a complete hive response. Uh, and the uh, cholinergic uh, urticaria patients, 100% had complete response using this pulse controlled ergometry, er, er, ergometry test. And then for dramatographism, using what uh, there was developed this Frick test where you have different levels of prongs that you scratch the skin, there was a 50% response. So they showed some good benefit. Um, but meanwhile, the company has decided not to pursue hives, but to pursue eosinophilic gastritis and eosinophilic gastrointestinal disorder. So, and I think this is an example where you have a small company that has to pick and choose where are they going to get the most penetration, where's their biggest bang in the market to get a product to market, and where's the biggest unmet need. And that's what their choice was. But there does seem to be some benefit, and it certainly confirms that cyclic 8 is relevant as a target for urticaria. Um, now, these are other pot uh, possible future targets. Uh, and you can see I've showed some of those pictorially, the neurokinin uh, 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 receptors, uh, because they can block substance P. And we know substance P is a direct activator of mast cells. That's why I was talking about this a little bit last night. But you know, the future of allergy is neuroimmunology, okay? because every time you depolarize a nerve, what happens? So you get neuropeptide release. What are these neuropeptides doing? They're activating mast cells in part. So when you see these mast cell activation cases, I don't think this is mast cell mediated purely. I think a lot of these patients also have a lot of dysautonomia. They all have, a lot of them have EDS, a lot of them have uh, POTS, a lot of them have flushing, a lot of them have um, gastroparesis syndrome, they have these migraines, they have all these other dysautonomic palpitations, dizziness. You'll see these patients if you're not seeing them already, and then they come in with this mast cell activation. They don't have a clonal proliferation of mast cells, but if they're depolarizing nerves, they might have some bi, there might be, a, it might be a bystander cell, okay, where you're activating these mast cells. That's why they in part respond to H1, H2 blockers and such, and leukotriene antagonists. But uh, it's an interesting phenomenon. I do think it exists as a clinical entity, but I think most of what we're seeing is shifted more towards this autonomic dysfunction. And this is what we have to be paying attention to and largely when we're treating these patients if they're to get better. Okay, so if you can click, characterize them, you can actually treat them fairly, not, they're not as difficult as what they appear to be. And so we're gonna hopefully write up our experience and share that because I think that um, it, we're only seeing these patients because uh, someone came up with the idea of mast cell activation. Now they're coming from neurology to us and from cardiology to us, okay? So we have to figure out what to do with them. Um, the, anyway, so there's a whole array of these treatments, uh, and it's kind of exciting, but there are different stages. The H4 receptors, are, we're currently doing this, but they're looking at these in the context of um, uh, atopic dermatitis, uh, TSLP, which is being looked at for a number of indications, uh, but has a broad spectrum, and this is a very high up in the, uh, in the, in the chain. Uh, it's one of the alarmins and the epithelial cells. Uh, the integrins, uh, there's obviously people looked at CD20. I think where we're starting to see now active enrollment of trials is the IL-4 receptor alpha, which is the, already has approval for atopic dermatitis, polyps, and uh, asthma. And there's uh, uh, some studies that were going on in Europe uh, looking at this, but uh, this program's already started to uh, uh, become uh, active, and I think uh, it looks very encouraging. Uh, but there's really not a lot of data out there just yet. Uh, the um, IL-13, uh, again, is another compound that's being looked at, but it's not really anywhere close. Venralizumab, and then the other IL-5. Why IL-5 antagonists in urticaria? Well, that's interesting. Um, uh, we did an investigator-initiated study, and I'll share some of the data. Yes. John, I'm, so, I'm sorry to interrupt you here. Some people may have to leave. I know they have a I would recommend you wait to hear this data, and then you can leave. I'll be done in two <laughs> seconds, okay? Right. This is the best part of the study, the okay? best part of the talk, okay? So this is a study that we did, okay? This is an investigator-initiated study. The objective is to determine the clinical efficacy of benralzomab for placebo in human subjects with chronic spontaneous urticaria, refracted <laughs> H1 antihistamines. We looked at UAS7s and Q CU quality of life. Secondary endpoints, we looked at eosinophil counts, ECP. We also looked at transcriptomes in the blood and in the uh, skin. We did biopsies. This is the clinical study design. They got essentially a placebo initially, and then they were rolled over to get active. They had three treatments, a Benral, 
uh, a, a month apart, and then there was a, a follow-up visit five, and then there was another follow-up visit one month later. So this was a single-blinded, repeated measures, placebo run-in study. Okay, so um, here's the data, again, basically showing that, uh, that this is looking at the UAS and quality of life scores between visits. And what we see, though, at, at end of visit four, there is a significant reduction in both the UAS-7 as well as the CU quality, uh, quality of life score, okay? Um, and again, uh, we had 12 patients enrolled, nine completed the studies, and uh, the, of those nine, uh, seven were responders, five were complete responders, okay? So, uh, and again, a very small study, but an, an, an important <laughs> signal uh, for the role of IL-5 uh, receptor uh, antagonists in the treatment of urticaria, showing, of course, we see complete uh, re uh, reduction in, in, uh, of um, the uh, eosinophils, um, the, this is looking at just the blood, okay, the uh, pre and post uh, differential expressed genes, uh, post benrosumab versus baseline blood, and the gene ontologies mediated by these expression genes. And so you can see that there were a number of these genes that were looked at, the, IDO, the EDO1, uh, Siglic8, as we just talked about, was a pathway that was affected, uh, IL-5-RA, not surprisingly, the ALOX15, uh, and the, ILR, the IL-1-R1 signaling receptor. So a lot of these things were uh, uh, downregulated. If you look at the um, comparison uh, downregulated by uh, amalizumab, by um, benrosumab, you look at the comparison to the amalizumab pilot study, uh, this is the Kaplan study, the Bernstein study, you see there was a different assessment tool used uh, three doses for benralizumab, uh, four doses for the omalizumab. Again, the mean change in score treatment at the end of the study, fairly comparable. Um, and uh, in terms of statistically significant effect after the first dose, both had good effects, although it was unclear from the omalizumab study whether there was this difference was adjusted for multiple comparisons. Again, in terms of response, seven of 12 responded uh, in 100 percent resolution in five subjects, eight out of 12 for the Kaplan study, uh, and then number of non-responders were fairly similar. Um, and again, quality of life uh, significantly improved for both studies. So this is actually being submitted, and uh, we have we have a late-breaking abstract on this at the academy. We also have on our on our skin biopsy, skin transcriptomes. Uh, some of these other data has already been uh, submitted. It's already been presented at other professional meetings. But uh, the, but I think that what it tells you is that these we don't really. This gives us indication that there may be obviously a, a greater role than when you just look at IL-5 receptors and say, oh, it just blocks eosinophils. There's further reaching uh, uh, pathways that one is not aware of with these cytokines, and we need to do these deep dives to really understand mechanistically what's going on. And in fact, when I showed it to some very prominent basic researchers, they said I would have never predicted these effects. And there's a, ni a nice explanation in our manuscript, if, it, when, if and when it gets accepted, which talks about what these pathways mean in terms of regulating uh, the uh, different processes uh, uh, involved in urticaria. So, in conclusion, phenotypes for CSU are heterogeneous. Endotypes are still lacking for many phenotypes hindering development of targeted therapies. Investigation of proteomes and transcriptomes may provide better insights to the pathomechanisms. Novel therapies used to treat uh, a disease that target critical cytokines, receptors, and perhaps biologic pathways appear promising for the future uh, for the treatment of chronic urticaria. But we have a long way to go. And so we still have to be good clinicians. You still need to be familiar with your full armamentarium of treatments available to treat uh, for the management of urticaria. So the confusing landscape requires continuous investigation.